Hey everybody, it's John with Murder by the Book. Uh, as you can see guys, I am at, at my house. We're trying out our first Facebook Friday. So we're hoping kind of while this goes on and who knows, maybe once kind of things settle down, we'll continue uh, try to bring you a new uh, author event every Friday live here on Facebook, um, at least until we can host them back in the store. Uh, tonight we've got Matthew Quirk here with us. Uh, we're super excited to do this. He was supposed to be at the store with us last week, the week before. Time has no meaning now, so I'm not sure how long ago, but um, he was supposed to be here a couple of days after his new book, Hour of the Assassin, came out. So we're really thrilled to be able to do this here with us. Uh, the book is available now. And before I forget to mention, uh, he was nice enough to send us some signed book plates. So when you order your copy, we'll tuck in a signed book plate for you. Uh, he is the New York Times bestselling author of Hour of the Assassin, which is the newest, uh, The Night Agent, The 500, The Directive, Cold Barrel Zero, and Dead Man Switch. He spent five years at The Atlantic reporting on crime, private military contractors, terrorism prosecutors, and international gangs, and he lives in San Diego. Hi, Matt, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, how are you doing? I'm good. Um, you know, getting used to being able to do stuff like this, it's, it's great that you were able to do this and we're still able to, to chat with customers um, about the book. It's kind of weird not being able to actually have people kind of in the store and be able to interact with them, so this is, Kind of a nice way to still be able to do some of that. Yeah, um, I miss I miss getting to hang out with the readers, but I'm glad we all have these tools, and you guys are being so great to, uh, you know, connect us this way. Yeah, um, it'll, it'll it'll also be kind of nice now that we're able to kind of do all this stuff. Like I said, to maybe still be able to do some more stuff like this, kind of once things um, kind of get back to normal. So that way, if people aren't able to get to Houston, or we'll still be able to bring them in. Uh, so, real easy question to start off. Uh, Hour of the Assassin just came out a couple of weeks ago. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the book? Uh, sure. It's a story, uh, DC political thriller, and it's about a former Secret Service agent who gets framed for really high profile murder and has to go on the run. And he gets pulled into a big conspiracy and finds himself working against uh, these really powerful forces, sort of the folks who pull the strings behind politicians and the book gets into how that works kind of in the real world too, um, who are working on taking over the most powerful office in the US, the, uh, the, in the world, the US presidency. So a lot of times in kind of thrillers like this, we tend to see our main character as kind of somer, sort of kind of a normal everyday guy who finds himself thrown into kind of these larger than life situations. But with you, your character is a former secret uh, service agent. So he's kind of got a little bit of background. What was your, um, what was the reasoning to have him kind of have that background instead of just being kind of a normal everyday guy doing this? Well, there's, you know, a, a balance in these books. It's fun to start with somebody who's a total everyman. You know, and by the end of the book, they're thrown into, uh, you know, these extreme situations and they have to yeah. pick up the gun. And then I also like doing books where um, the guy is in the action from the very beginning. So this was that kind of book. And um, he's a neat character because, you know, he spent so much time with the Secret Service sort of protecting against threats to high ranking government officials and assassins, he was able to sort of think like them and put himself in the mind of the villain. So that's what he does now. Um, so as a character, he's set up to be, you know, very capable from the beginning. And yeah, I like those because you can kind of be off to the races from the first scene. Yeah. Uh, so what kind of research did you do um, into the Secret Service? Um, did you have any of kind of, a, of that experience before just with the, the crime or with the newspaper reporting that you did? Uh, no, I know some people there and kind of checked with them, um, some former uh, agents and checked with them on, you know, how things might go. Mm -hmm. And that was helpful. I read, you know, I always read books, um, memoirs and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, there's a terrific book about the assassination of um, the attempted assassination of President Reagan called Rawhide Down, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember the author's name right now, but that was um, down the street from my old house. And, wow. and you know, it's, the, it's sort of a notorious spot in DC. Yeah. And um, the other aspect of the research, so he was in the Secret Service for a long time, but then he gets out and does this work where he sort of poses as an assassin. Um, and he is what's known as a red teamer in security circles where um, you pretend to be the bad guy. And that was research that um, I had sort of slowly gotten into more and more over the years. And it started 
was some of my first books because it was about a, um, a young man who needed to have a background in breaking into places and being kind of a thief. And through that research, um, I found these red team um, experts because it's, it's really hard to research these books because you can't like find actual criminals and assassins right. who will tell you how to do it. Um, <laughs> and so when I first ran across the fact that there were people who do this job yeah. and then write up a report saying, you know, well, I tried to break into the Department of Defense. I was successful. <laughs> here's how I did it. And here's how I would kill a senator, you know, hypothetically as an audit. And so as a thriller author, where you're constantly um, figuring out how to realistically depict these scenes where people are doing these sort of um, these jobs, just getting that stuff was like a gift from heaven and I was cruising yeah. through it. And I got to know them more and more over the years and um, did some trainings with them and that kind of thing. So I've been wanting to write a book about this, um, this red team world and this sort of mock assassin stuff for a long time. Did you have to, uh, so Jack Carr, who's another thriller writer, had a book, um, his second book last year was supposed to come out in April and then it turned out uh, he's a former uh, SEAL, seal I, think. I think. Yeah, um, but then they, it turned out that the first book, the um, Department of Justice, they didn't need to like reread it or read it, but then the second one, they were like, oh no, we need to read this to make sure there's nothing like classified in it. Did you have to run any of the, the stuff that you had in the book by anybody before because you were using some of that source material? Uh, no, that's just if you ever work for the government, you sign your life away. Yeah. That you're always um, up for a review um, because I think it's a condition of your clearance. Yeah, I think so. Um, your security clearance. But, you know, I'm just a reporter, so, or was a reporter. So everything I get is non classified and there's no review or anything like that. And, um, you know, I get to talk to people who, did work at you know FBI, say Secret Service, and um, oh, what's you know as, as a novelist, I'm not interested. As a novelist, I'm not interested in you know classified stuff. Often, it's about getting kind of the details of the world right. Although you know, occasionally there is um, a TTP. It's like tactics, techniques, and procedures. I might be getting that wrong, and that's the cool stuff you read a thriller for, mm -hmm. um, and that's what. Uh, the government protects. So um, I do have one sort of guidebook on security and breaking into places and safes and locks. And I have the, um, I kind of have access to the government Very edition cool. of that, which is fun to <laughs> pillage for these books. Uh, so when you're, um, when you're kind of dealing with all of the, those details about being able to break into stuff like that, so how much of it um, do you try to kind of make more fact-based and how much of it do you just have fun planning this and just kind of make up? So that's, uh, that's a really interesting question. And um, it really came up for me first when I was writing about um, people in the special operations community. And, uh, you know, Jack Carr was in San Diego. And I met him through, you know, friends of friends here, um, when he was just getting his first book published. And I mean, he's an incredible author, and it's been great to see him take off. Um, and so, Oh, I'm blanking on the, uh, oh, the fact versus fiction. Yeah, I blanked on the question for a second. <laughs> so um, when I started, and I had a friend who did similar work, and when I moved to San Diego, I just um, happened to know people who were in that world and got pretty close with some of them. And so I wrote about it, and that was an instance where I was like, you have to get this right. You need to get everything perfect. It can't be like G.I. Joe, mm. Hollywood, BS. And so I did a lot of, you know, work talking to people. I did a lot more reporting. And it was funny because I did so much work that finally they were like, listen, you're writing thrillers, <laughs> get the details right. But like, nobody wants to read a book where, you know, before you go kill the bad guy and rescue your best friend, there's like five meetings with a hundred people over <laughs> like teleconference and you know all the bureaucracy of it so they're like so it's fine to bs a little bit and you know just because uh, i didn't want to do anything uh kind of disrespectful writing about that world i almost had to do enough research to know it well enough to take the license to make a bunch of stuff up okay. um and that's you know the fun part about research is you, you get all the details right, and then you can um, 
have the reader so enmeshed in the world that you can have your big finale where maybe you're starting to heighten the reality and um, you know stuff that would never happen in a million years <laughs> where I mean yeah like there's never one guy against a hundred people in one of these books you know um, so uh, so that's really kind of the the way the research brought me back to some of the dramatic license I take. So you just kind of have to know just enough of it to be able to kind of make it plausible and go from there. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to know like what they would do and then to be like, well, it's also really fun to make explosives out of stuff you buy at a beauty supply shop and then like, yeah. you know, blow through the wall of a place and jump through it. And that's not something that people do. <laughs> and when I first started reporting these, it was really funny because that would be like, so, you know, when you're rappelling out of a window in a skyscraper and shooting the window below to go in, what kind of rope are you using? And they were just like, dude, it's a thriller. You can, you know, <laughs> make that up and then, uh, you know, get the other stuff right. Well, I imagine that's gotta be kind of a challenge too because you have to be able to get those details in there, but because it's a thriller and people expect it to be fast paced, you have to kind of keep the story moving mm -hmm. while giving everybody kind of enough of the details to be able to create that world. And one of the things I think that, I don't know that people kind of think of when they think of like kind of thrillers or mysteries, you know, with the sci-fi world, there's kind of this concept of world building because you have mm -hmm. to basically create a whole new world. But I think, you know, mystery writers and especially thriller writers, I mean, you have to do kind of almost the exact same thing because you're creating this other new world too. Yeah, and you know, it was that was an interesting aspect of this book because I was taking, you know, bits and pieces of real world stuff, like these red team people and this concept of, you know, somebody who poses as an assassin. And, you know, so there was, there was like real source material. For instance, the thing that got me started on this world was a study um, done by sort of government security auditors where they were trying to sneak bombs into the offices of basically cabinet heads to see how it would go. And they used real explosives, although they were like mixed down so they couldn't like blow up a whole building. Um, and they, you know, I got a copy of the study that talked about how they did it all. Um, and so I was like, wow, these people kind of pose as assassins, you know? And, and you know, to dramatize it in the book, um, in the opening scenes, you know, this is like the first few pages, it's not really spoiler city, but, um, you know, if, you're, if you just want to get the whole thing fresh, cover your ears for a sec. Um, the, you know, the guy rolls up behind the target during a mock assassination and is like, you're dead, you know? So that's where you um, kind of build that world. So Hour of the Assassin is very much in this like heightened reality. And I took um, elements from different real red team work and, and kind of raised it up and sexed it up for the thriller. So you did um, a couple of books where you had recurring characters, like, um, so you've had two characters where they've car carried over from book to book, but your last two have been standalones. What's, what are some of the challenges of kind of being able to go back to another character versus having to start fresh? Uh, well, they both have their challenges. Um, you know, the series, it's a question of setting up your person and your protagonist so that they can, you know, be in a circumstance. And also you have this world to build and to keep everyone moving along in different arcs, you know? And um, with the standalone, the challenge is that you are starting from scratch and you need to build a character that engages people from the beginning. Um, and I don't know, I feel like there's more pressure on the story. It's less of like a, in this week's episode, you run into, you know, um, this new villain. Um, but I recently with the standalones, it's really just driven by the story. And the stories have been driven by these characters who I ran across while doing, you know, research and reporting or, you know, all the way back to when I worked in DC. So, you know, the night agent was based on a friend of mine who was like a, a night, um, you know, intelligence, he worked a night desk. And um, Hour of the Assassin was inspired by these folks too. So, you know, that's a situation where you have a, a character that sort of suggests a great opening scene and a hook. And then I often like to 
find a character who has, you know, one thing that's, you know, the, um, that's been chasing them their whole lives. And then you sort of can put them through a crucible to not only face the big external mm -hmm. scary stakes of the book, but also whatever they're working on. So that, uh, that tends to be more suited um, to standalones. And so just the stories I've been drawn to recently have uh, fit more into that template. It's kind of like a movie versus a great TV series. Um, so that's you know what I've done for the last couple. Yeah. Uh, reading wise, do you tend to gravitate more towards standalones yourself or series for your personal reading? Uh, I do both, you know, I have my like, go to people who I'm, you know, waiting and just order every one of them and can't wait to see what's, you know, going on with those characters like Daniel Silva, Michael Connelly. Um, and yeah, I, and I, I like standalones too, because, you know, there's an aspect to them where um, you, you have no idea what's going to happen. Um, you can have more twists because you have no background on any of the characters, yeah. you know? And, and sometimes you'll have a twist in a series where somebody will like do a heel turn, you know? And you're like, well, I don't really, I don't really buy that. You know, I've known them for six books and, you know, suddenly their like cousin gets killed and they're evil. So um, I think I like standalones for um, the surprise and the way all the characters can surprise you. And sometimes it's nice to just pick up a book and you know that there's no more commitment beyond that one book. Like you don't have to potentially keep up with the series. Um, I think sometimes that's kind of nice too. Yeah, like absolutely. Um, and then, you know, there, there are series that are very standalone-ish mm -hmm. where it's like kind of a gunslinger Western thing like Lee Child's books yeah. where, um, you know, and they're fascinating because it's almost, he's done different experiments with more serial storytelling, but you just, drop them into a city and there's and there's no history and no future. So um, it's kind of a neat standalone within a series vibe. Yeah. yeah, on the bookseller end, those are really nice too because then people will be like, oh, there are like 47 of these, I don't know where to go. And he's like, you can just literally pick any one of them. Like this might be one of our favorites mid series you can go. Cause um, we have trained our readers very well that they like to start with a series and go all the way through which is great, we do too. But um, yeah, sometimes the standalones are nice bookseller wise to just be able to hand somebody a book and say here give this a shot um so what are you working on now uh now i'm working on the next book which is uh another real life inspiration and it's um this cold war thing i kind of ran across where after the fall of the soviet union um some dissidents who had come here talked about how the Soviet Union had sort of buried um, weapons or different elements of a plot to uh, get back at the United States and sabotage. And so that's, that's the real world kernel thing. But I'm just uh, fascinated by this idea that there could be a, a Soviet plot that's sort of buried and waiting to be rekindled, maybe like even very few people knew um, within the Soviet military or intelligence um, apparatus that it was there. So you could have, you know, one person on his or her own who could re-trigger it. And it, you know, it ties in thematically what's happening in the world with the idea that we thought the Cold War was over and, you know, we were allies with Russia. And now um, there seems to be this new Cold War and Russia is very aggressive. So I just, I love that world. Um, so that's what the, uh, the book kind of delves into. Um, so how did your background in crime reporting kind of help you write um, kind of thrillers and specifically these kind of thrillers? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's just a lot of um, background material in geopolitics mm -hmm. where you're like oh i need a you know i need a I need a country that's kind of <laughs> secretly a russian satellite but still um welcome in the u.s and they're like oh i can go with these these people um so and then you know i started working at the magazine a couple years after september 11th 
And all of Washington was just in like doomsday plot research mode. Yeah. And that's all anybody did. So it was dirty bombs and sarin gas and, you know, all these different yeah. um, terror groups. And so I was just kind of immersed in that stuff for a while. And it's, you know, all still kind of on the mental shelf of if you want a villain to do this or that thing. And a lot of it, the value of it just came from being in DC and trying to, and just kind of the osmosis of being there for a long time. And that's something you bring into the books because, you know, you want a satisfying conspiracy, but you want it to feel grounded and true. So knowing kind of how DC works and having spent a lot of time there knowing the characters, you can, you know, mix in the real and then sprinkle in a little bit of sort of that heightened reality aspect um, to hopefully tell a pretty compelling story. Uh, one of the one of the things we we see a lot, like when people like Brad Thor or uh, Brad Taylor, Daniel Silva come through, um, one of the questions people always ask is um, how they're able to. It seems like time a book, so an issue that they're talking about, like you said, kind of potentially this next one with kind of more Cold War stuff, but still happening, always somehow tend to line up really well with current things that are going on almost in a way that like they predicted these things. Um, do you think some of that is just because too, you're kind of already in that world and you can sort of see where, where things are going? Yeah. I mean, I think if you just read the, you know, if you're just reading the news every day and talking to people about what's happening, um, you see what's up next but it's really it's a really tricky game to do the pulled from the headlines um you know next episode sort of thing I, I know some people who consult for homeland and um like former intelligence people and they just sit down and are like well what's six things going on in intelligence and we'll just weave those into the show and they can but they can kind of rewrite as they go mm -hmm. um and books are tricky because people have you know, nine to 12 month lead times yeah. from when you say this book is finished mm -hmm. until it publishes. So I was, you know, pretty far along with a story that the big finale kind of happened where there was almost a war with Iran. And I was like, oh man, that's what's waiting in the wings if everything goes wrong with this story. And I was like, well, throw it in the garbage and glad and be glad that it happened um, now instead of when you just finished copy editing. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're we're all coming from the same source material, or I mean, everyone's reading the same news and yeah. sort of riffing off it and that sort of thing. Um, but it's it's really a tricky game to do the rip from the headlines. And the night agent had a very close to the headlines plot, and it was really a white knuckle for a while because. Uh, what started as a real outlandish thriller conceit in the book yeah. was suddenly sort of page one speculation in all the newspapers about like, how close is the president to Russia? You know, did they help him yeah. get elected? Um, all of these things. And I actually had to pretty far along the book add a twist to, um, you know, make sure I stayed ahead of the news and kept surprises. So that worked out well, but I think it's it's very nerve wracking, so I'm not gonna try to do that again. It, it sounds like it, and I, and I imagine just kind of as fast as news moves nowadays, it's just gonna make it even harder because there's just kind of that 24 hour news cycle. So you're always finding out stuff that's gonna make it tricky too. Oh yeah, and the news cycle today is crazy. Like what we would have talked about for a year is now like on page two instead of page one, and then it's forgotten the next day. It's just, I mean, there's so much going on, so. I sort of think a little bit differently about these thrillers, you know, at times when I first started writing them, it was like, oh, I'll take the DC I know and then sex it up a little bit with the you know, murder and blackmail and conspiracy. And now uh, I think about the role of political thrillers and fiction a little differently, I think, you know, it, it's nice to have these plots and stories and villains that sort of make sense and have a something of like a moral universe and you have people you can root for because you know the real world now it just seems like 
so chaotic and crazy and so much of, um, you know, the suffering just doesn't seem to even make any sense. So, uh, you know, there's another aspect of what fiction can do for us all and storytelling can do for us all in, um, you know, giving some familiarity and making sense of things. Um, I think I, I think we, we hear that a lot. Kind of that's one of the reasons why people love kind of crime fiction in general is because for the most part, kind of like with a romance novel where you know it's going to end with happy ever after, like you know that there's going to be some kind of resolution to this problem. And I think, you know, anytime that's comforting, I think now it's specifically so. Yeah, I'm like, oh, a Russian assassin? That's like a, a, a weighted blanket, you know, compared to, uh, <laughs> you know, going outside and catching some awful epidemic or just like, you know. Yeah the government not working. So with kind of the not being able to go outside stuff, so how is that working for you as a writer? Does it not being able to kind of go out anywhere? Does it just kind of feel like normal because this is what life is like when you're working on a book or are you kind of antsy kind of wanting to get out in the world? Are we not supposed to go outside anymore? I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not, it's not, I, I'm very fortunate in, the you know this this job and uh, you know it's a joke that we authors do a lot of social distancing i mean i just sit here all day mm -hmm. and um you know my going out is often taking a run or a walk to brainstorm something so i'm i'm just incredibly fortunate that um i get to do that and um you know but we're part of this publishing world so yeah. You know, we're worried about and trying to give as much support as possible to, you know, the booksellers. And I know the publishers are working really hard to figure out everything in this new world. So, um, yeah, I'm fortunate as authors to be able to kind of work from home and it's not that big a change. Um, right. It's it's wild times now and I'm hoping it works out for everyone. Yeah, it's weird. We're um, so the store is we're basically kind of taking turns going up and being able to like pr process orders remotely. Luckily, we can just with the kind of stay at home order, we can just kind of lock the doors and kind of go in and process online stuff. And luckily, our distributor can send a lot of stuff directly to home. So we're able to do it that way. But it's kind of it's weird only potentially being at the bookstore maybe three or four hours a day and not having any customers come in or potentially have people kind of come up that we know and just kind of wave and be like, sorry, we can't let you in. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. It's definitely an odd, yeah. odd time. I've done a couple um, local signing, stock signings. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to one bookstore and they're like, I'll meet you in the alley, you know? <laughs> and then I, I'm going to another one and it's gonna be like a drive-by thing. Um, yeah. So I don't know, I'm just really appreciative of everything the booksellers are doing, Murder by the Book is doing to keep us all connected, keep people in good books. Yeah. It's, it's kind of nice to, for us, I know, um, I speak for the rest of the staff, it's nice to actually be able to still do stuff like this and still be able to actually get into the store and process orders because it also kind of keeps us from, from going insane too. <laughs> and it's, it's so weird. So our last actual in-store event, we had um, Peter Swanson at the store March 12th and Deanna Rayburn March 13th, and that was our last one. So this is the first actual kind of author thing we've done in almost a month, oh, um, wow. which is cuckoo for us because, you know, we usually do two or three a week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like it because I, you know, um, I'm wearing my pajamas. Over the shirt. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, it's, it's, and we're book people. So maybe this is a way to stay connected, you know, from home. Uh, but I do really miss getting out in those stores and meeting people. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the, the flip side, I don't know if it's the flip side. The thing about being an author is you spend like, nine to 12 months by yourself working on this yeah. book and then once a year um and i i love it because i you know love getting out and meeting people mm -hmm. you go and you go from being by yourself in a room for a year to yeah. being in seven cities in nine days and just meeting people um but that's the one moment where you can see this story that you've just been with in your head for a year you can see it connecting with another person. It's not like um, Ariana Grande and I can like see people, you know, as I sing or something. So um, that's that's a really nice moment and, and I miss it, um, but I'm, I'm glad we can do this. Yeah. 
Yeah, me too. So um, I think we are running close to time. So everybody, Hour of the Assassin is available now. Um, we are, like I said, we're processing online orders. Um, we're uh, basically Monday through Saturday from 11 to 3, we're reachable. We're always reachable through the store's website, Murder Books. Um, you can email us at order at Murder Books. We've got um, lots of book plates. We've got lots of copies of Hour of the Assassin at the store. So um, we can get those to you. Um, Matt, thanks so much for, for joining us. And hopefully we'll get to see you at the store um, this time next year. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm thinking of you and everyone at the store. Thank you much. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll see, you, I'll see you soon. Alrighty, take care. Take care. Thanks.